What are you? What? I, I'm a person. Yeah, I. but I mean, what are you? I, I'm a woman. No, no, no. I mean, what are you? Like, where are your parents from? They're from the United States. No, before that. Where did they come from? You have such great Norwegian hair. Can I touch it? Oh my god, it's like so silky and soft. Oh, it's fantastic. You're probably really good at playing hockey. No, I don't know how to skate. Really? Well, that's interesting. Do you go to NASCAR races? No, I don't watch racing. Wow. Like, you golf, though, don't you? <laughs> Actually, no. I, I like to play volleyball, go to the beach. I like being outdoors in the sun. Really? But mm -hmm. you're so pale. <laughs> I bet it's hard for you to get a tan, isn't it? I mean, don't you just burn? <sighs> I bet you really like mayonnaise. <laughs> Not particularly, no. You're not totally white, are you? I mean, all white people like mayonnaise. <sighs> Did it take you a long time to learn how to square dance? Or is it just like natural to you people? <laughs> so yes, this is kind of funny and strange. I mean, how ridiculous those questions were, right? How odd it is to have someone ask me that and yet act too. You have a great Italian hair. But I'm not Italian. You're so exotic. Oh, yeah, like an animal in, a, in captivity. You know, you're not like other blacks. You, you know what I mean? No, I don't. What do you mean? I, you know, thuggish, gangsta. <laughs> You're so ethnic. You know, Lyra, you don't act black enough. Well, what does that mean? Tell us what it was like to grow up. Oh, I bet you have great stories. Oh, you mean how I grew up in America, just like you did. The, the end. end. Race is a difficult topic. It can make one person extremely proud, another person extremely ashamed, and someone else extremely confused. Race is personal and societal. The experiences I want to share today are my experiences and views. I cannot speak for anyone but me. We are coming to accept the individual's voice in terms of gender. We have a long way to go before non-binary, gender fluid, and transgendered people are fully accepted, but we're getting there. In terms of race, we still seem to be an either-or society without a clear place for individuals who are or look in between. My struggle to answer the question, what are you, began just before I started kindergarten. I remember my mother preparing me for my first day of school. I knew how to read and how to print my letters. I knew my numbers and my colors. If anyone asks you what you are, my mother told me, you tell them you're black. I thought that was an odd instruction and an even odder answer. Thinking of the pointed crayon in my new box, I replied, I'm not black. She got very angry and insisted I was, but she wouldn't tell me why or what she meant. In the kitchen was a jar of M&M candies. Do you remember the tan ones? I got one and I took it back to her. It was as close a match as I could find. I'm sort of tan, I said, but my mother insisted that I tell people I was black. I pulled out one of the only weapons I had as a five-year-old. Why? 
Why do I say that? Why? My mother returned fire and ended the fight with her favorite parental weapon. Because I said so. Without an answer, I could understand. I went off to school with the response in my head and the hope that the question wouldn't come up. It wasn't very long at all, though, before it did. A little boy asked me, what are you? I drew a deep breath and said, I'm black with as much confidence as one can have when they aren't sure about something. I waited to see if he believed me. No, you're not, he said, pointing to some of the children whose complexions were darker than mine. They're black. You're sort of tan. <laughs> I didn't know what to say, but in my mind I was thinking, see, Mom, I told you so. I wouldn't have the words until years later, but I was racially ambiguous. Much has been written about race being only a societal construct and how it affects our identities and how others see us. In her book, in her book Choosing Ethnic Identity, Mary Song discusses how racially ambiguous people, like myself, sometimes experience a disjuncture between how we perceive our own racial identities and how society perceives us. She uses the example of a light-skinned person wanting to identify as black, but society insisting that they are white. It's very similar to the internal, external theories of self that exist. I've always been at odds with my internal and external images. I remember looking into a mirror as a child and being afraid of the reflection. For some reason, and I don't know why, I expected to see an adult woman, tall and beautiful with blonde hair and green eyes. I didn't connect with the actual reflection at all. My mother's unexplained response to my kindergarten question added confusion to my ideas about myself. So dealing with these things on two major fronts has been ex unbelievably challenging. <clears throat> now, I found ways to deal with the physical appearance. That early idea about what I look like has remained with me all of these years, and I don't know why. However, I'm quite famous for my hair pieces and wigs, my colored contacts, and my high-heeled shoes, so I can sort of get to that image that I had all those years ago. But a solution for handling my racial ambiguity has been more elusive. I found that many times the things I do and the things over which I have no control are misunderstood. Two childhood examples come to mind. In elementary school, I had made it a mission to be welcoming to everyone and helpful to my teachers. In second grade, when Miss Burlingame asked me if I would mind sitting on the floor so a new girl could sit at my desk, I didn't hesitate. I was promised a new desk the next day, so of course, that sweetened the deal. I was happy to sit on the floor, and I couldn't wait to tell my mom how helpful to Kelly I'd been. My mother asked what race she was. I wasn't sure why it mattered. But when I said she was white, my mother hit the roof. She said the teacher was racist for asking me to give up my seat. It wasn't until I learned about segregated seating that I understood why my mother was so angry about what I did. But I didn't view what I had done in those terms because her experience wasn't mine. I was just being friendly. And it's a good thing I was. My new classmate's family had moved in right next door to us. Imagine being the new kid who had to sit on the floor and living next door to the little girl who was unwelcoming to her. As it turned out, Kelly became one of my best friends, and several years ago, we witnessed the child dedication ceremony of her nieces in this church. I'd also become friends with the girl who lived on the other side of Kelly. Renee was black, and she was one of my really good friends, too. She was funny and beautiful, and we had so much fun. There were two other African-American girls in my third grade class. However, one day, all of them unfriended me. They would laugh at me in class and bully me at recess. My mother said, they're just jealous of you. 
I didn't know why. I wasn't pretty or smart, and we certainly weren't wealthy. It wasn't until after I learned about the hierarchy of skin tones that lean towards preference of people with my complexion that I guessed the reason for this jealousy. So from an early age, race was confusing to me in a way that it didn't seem to be for my older sister and younger brother, even though he had similar coloring to mine. Stephen Sondheim wrote, children will look to you for which way to turn, to learn how to be. Children will listen. Maybe if I'd been given explanations, I wouldn't still be struggling with the question of identity today. I mean, surely there had to have been someone in my family who could have understood my feelings and been there to help instead of leaving me out there on my own. I didn't need to look closer than my mother and grandmother. It's clear I received my coloring from them. Surely they faced some of the questions I did. So why weren't they, they there to guide me? Maybe because my grandmother was born in 1907, as Jim Crow laws were growing, and my mother was born in 1930, as they were reaching their peak. Perhaps their own experiences with being racially ambiguous were confusing and negative, and they couldn't bear reliving them again. Consequently, it's been difficult to develop a sense of where I belong, so I've often felt alone. In high school, I was part of Gateway Dance Theater. At the time, most of the members were black. I loved being in the group, but at the same time, I felt like an outsider. I never felt that I connected with the other girls. It wasn't just an issue of color. There, I found it was also an issue of culture. Culture is a huge part of race that never seems to be discussed. Take music and television, for example. Hip-hop was on the rise. LL Cool J, Ice-T, the Fat Boys, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, they all dominated the musical conversation between the girls during the rehearsals. I couldn't join in because the radios in my house were tuned to either top 40 stations or AM oldie stations. We had Madonna and Duran Duran and the Carpenters and Barry Manilow <laughs> playing. We watched the black sitcoms of the day, like The Cosby Show and Different Strokes and Benson. But we were just as likely to have Night Court or Cheers or Newhart on. I didn't know anything about Charlie and Company or Soul Train or Amen. I felt like a racial imposter. Black, but not really. I really was in a gray area. Finally, I had an aha moment. At some point, an uncle traced the history of my mother's family and discovered that in addition to the African heritage, we had ancestors from Scotland, Ireland, Germany, and Denmark. For some reason, having this knowledge made me feel more integrated, like I was closer to solving the mystery of me. Yet that also came with questions. The accepted rule was and is that whatever your parents are, so are you. But remember, I'd been questioning what I was since I was five. I wasn't fully accepted by the African American community and I couldn't say I was white. Was it possible that I could use this new information to help me shape my own identity? Or rather, should I use it in this way? I puzzled over this for a long time, and in the end, I decided that I could, I should, and I would. How could I not? I mean, here was evidence that helped me understand what I didn't before. At the time, DNA didn't, testing didn't exist, so I didn't know what the European percentage was, but I felt a kinship to these people as much as I did to anyone else in my family. Yes, the circumstances of how their DNA, European DNA, came to be mixed with African DNA were most likely the result of slavery and rape. It's horrific to think of what my African ancestors went through. But I came from that. I wouldn't be here without every culture that went into creating me, so how can I deny 
any part of what I am. I just, I just can't do it. Claiming a multiracial heritage makes sense to me. And yet, I still feel like an imposter. Disclaiming a multiracial heritage when my parents didn't and couldn't make me a traitor to African Americans? Does the fact that I didn't start to feel whole until I learned I had European ancestry make me a terrible person? My family would say, oh, yes, it does, which is why I didn't discuss it with any of them. I have African American friends who do, which is why I try not to discuss it with them. Some of my dearest friends absolutely refuse to accept my decision. To them, I am black and nothing else. Perhaps they feel that with my complexion, I'm trying to pass, or that I feel I'm somehow better than other people. I have tried to explain that that's not it at all, but they don't believe me. Caucasians seem more accepting of this, but for some of them, it's not enough, which leads to the questions of, what are you? Or questions that begin with, why do African Americans, insert question. They ask me how I feel about police shootings and harassment of blacks and people of color, and what should be done about it in this age of Black Lives Matter. My first thought is to say, why do you even need to ask? It's simple. It's absolutely despicable and inhumane and way past time for it to stop. Well, how do we stop it? Excellent question. Why are you asking me? It took me this long to come up for, with an answer for what I am, and my response is not accepted most of the time. Why would anyone think that I have the answers to racial and identity issues that have plagued this country since its birth? As much as I would love to be the one to solve these things, I can't. But perhaps a start would be for everyone to take a, a clue from Aretha Franklin and start offering the respect that we're all entitled to and deserve. That starts by asking, who are you? Not, what are you? And then respecting the answers you receive. Because racial identity is so personal that negating the responses you receive especially if they don't fit with your opinions or viewpoints, also negates the person you're talking to. When I was in Dallas in 2013 for a convention, I created kind of a stir. <laughs> I, people kept coming up to me and asking me, what are you? I mean, they were coming into like the booth that I was working and wanting their picture taken with me. I, yeah, I felt like a celebrity, but it was, you know, weird. One woman asked, and she persisted in the way the questioning in the skit that Kelly and I did, or Katie and I did earlier. She kept asking me where I was from and didn't, didn't accept Iowa as an answer. <laughs> I knew what she meant. She wanted to know what my ethnicity was. But I didn't know her, and I wasn't going to play along. Finally, realizing she wasn't going to get the answer she wanted, she stopped. Before she walked away, she said, You're not from Iowa. I've been to Iowa. They don't make people that look like you in Iowa. She wanted me to be what she wanted me to be, but I couldn't because I am me. I can't make someone believe that I'm what they think, and I can't pretend to be someone I'm not. However, it is kind of fun to keep people guessing. <laughs> I like to think that I'm helping them reframe their reference. 
Maybe, like the little girl in the story, I don't match, but I'm okay with that. I make no apologies. This is me.